Hello, everybody. God, I almost feel like I don't need this. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's more intimate this way. Um, I'm Dan Michalko, and probably part of the reason I'm shying away from the mic is I do that for a living. Um, I run WCBE, one of the local public radio affiliates, two blocks that way. <laughs> um, but the reason I'm here, I mean, it does seem odd to have a guy who makes his entire living dealing in nothing but sound on a graphics panel. But the reason is, along with that sound, maybe it's because of the deprivation at work all day, only using my ears. But off of work, I am probably one of the biggest graphics uber geeks in Columbus. And the man who just did that, Max Inc., is the one who actually said, have Dan come and do this one. <laughs> um, between that, being a visual geek and a tech geek, I'm a total alpha geek. My background's actually in physics, academically. My wife says that inside I am Sheldon. <laughs> I just have a very good mask. Now this particular topic, we're here to talk about digital alternatives, comics, the internet, and independent publishing. And this one, fortunately, is very near and dear to my heart, almost literally, because I've got my hero initiative button <laughs> right next to my heart. I'm also a writer. I teach at Thurber House. I help kids learn creative writing. And so the issue of creators' rights is very, very important to me. Right, going right back to Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, and up more currently, in my lifetime anyway, more contemporaneously, Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee when they left to establish Image Comics. Again, mainly because of creator rights. Now back then, they didn't have a lot of alternatives. The tubes for the interwebs hadn't really been bored very deep at that point. DARPA kind of owned the whole thing. So it was print or nothing. But today that has changed. <laughs> And it's clear that the internet can make a big difference. These four people are all going to prove that to you. In my life, I think about the different web comics that I've read, what I've gotten hooked on, and stuff that startled me, like Axe Cop. Without the internet, Axe Cop never could have happened. No way a publisher would have taken a risk on a comic written by a five-year-old. It'd be a worse world. <laughs> <laughs> So we're just going to talk about all that. That was kind of like the theoretical stuff out of the way now, the intro. Now they're going to give you their views, their backgrounds, and the practical experience so that hopefully when you walk away from this panel, you'll be able to launch something yourself or improve what you've already got. Our basic format, we're going to kind of hybridize. Everybody gets 15 minutes. And they'll make a little bit of an intro presentation. And whatever time remains, the panel will discuss, debate, not necessarily in public radio style, um, <laughs> what they just heard. And then the final 15 minutes will be more of an open discussion, summing up everything that was said. And maybe I'll steer it to a couple questions that I've been dying to ask all four of you. So briefly, the panel, we have Joel Jackson, founder of Two-Headed Monster Comics. Next to him, Katie Valeska, the creator of Next Year's Girl. Jones Weedle. Did I pronounce it right? OK. Creator of Helvetica. And Ian J, the proprietor of Ian J Super Comics. So just because he promised he was going to really amuse me, we'll start with Joel Jackson. Joel? All right. Starting off with a warning, that's not good, is it? Uh, <laughs> OK. So this is kind of in response to some, uh, some things we were talking about earlier in the symposium about uh, traditional means of illustrating comics and more modern takes on it. Uh, it says, warning, comics traditionalists beware. The following content could be extremely upsetting. If you have a history of extreme nostalgia, love the smell of newsprint, and or have a history of ink-stained fingers, watch and listen at your own risk. Just kidding. Uh, this is, oh, it's not working. Crap. <laughs> um, can you fix it, guy? <laughs> I'll go back. Hey, it's a good reason, right? Someone needs to draw you a cape before this is done. <laughs> Oh, look at that. 
Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's the, the warning. Um, <laughs> just kidding, I, I like that stuff too. But, um, so this is digital arts alternatives, uh, making comics with ones and zeros, not pencils and pens. Uh, by me, Joel Jackson. I'm a cartoonist and a designer. If you guys don't know me, I know we just kind of talked about it. Um, Self-publishing since 1999. Uh, founder of Two Other Monster Comics. Uh, I'm the artist on Radio Free Gehanna, The Toyetic Adventures of Coco Fiasco, and parts of the Little Monsters EP. All available out front. Um, so, do you work digitally because you can't work traditionally? Look, I can use those as well. Uh, I used to use those, and I, and I still do for certain projects. Um, I self-published for a while and got out of it for whatever reason, and uh, whenever I went to go get married, my wife and I discussed what we wanted for our favor, and we thought that making a comic about our life together so far up until the wedding, because uh, there have been a lot of really weird coincidences and things that happened, uh, might be a really good story to tell and uh, a personal story for all our friends and family. So I started drawing comics again. I mean, I've always loved comics and it's always been a huge part of my life, um, but this really jump-started it back again. Uh, the sequence is from the, the proposal. All drawn traditionally, colored digitally, lettered digitally, but you know, pen and ink, brush, what have you. And then, um, that really sparked it again. This is what started Two-Headed Monster Comics. If you look at the logo, it's my wife's head and my head as one monster. Um, but then I started thinking about it more and like what kind of books I would want to make myself. And uh, you know, I'd done that before and written the stories and I can write, but it really doesn't interest me as much. So I wanted to find a writer. And um, I ended up collaborating with a person I used to talk to at the comic shop all the time, James Moore, who you've seen earlier today. Uh, and we started with uh, Radio Free Gehanna. Uh, slice of life book about it's like a romantic comedy about a pirate radio station um, and I drew all of this practically like you would a comic book right like normally uh, this cover was she was drawn in illustrator but the insides were all pen and ink toned in Photoshop lettered and laid out in InDesign I also use uh, illustrator so you know pretty traditional nothing you haven't seen before uh, until I got to the script for issue two, where, and James had talked about it earlier today, if you guys were in here at the writer's collaboration panel, uh, there, in every scene pretty much in the book, it takes place in the past and the present, and how to figure out how to do that was really, it was complex in my head, because if I were to do it traditionally, I would have to draw the page twice, or draw the panels twice, and then take it in, and, you know, mess with it a bunch, and it was just a lot of stuff to make this. I mean, it, it would be worth it, because I think it works out, but I had already been toying around with the idea of going digitally. Um, a lot of different comic artists have been skewing that way, a lot of people using Photoshop and stuff, but then I learned about um, Manga Studio, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty awesome. <laughs> So I bought it, and it was, you can get it for half price if you guys are at all interested in it. They have sales on it all the time. And uh, you know, I had my Wacom tablet, and, and it was good, um, but it wasn't quite there. So I started looking into uh, the missing piece of the puzzle. So I had, you know, I drew comics, I had this new thing so I could work in layers and like have all these effects, it was great. Um, but there was still that like pen to paper element missing. So I started thinking about it, and uh, there were two decisions, one decision I had to make. I had two things I could select from. Uh, the Cintiq, which you guys know what a Cintiq is. It's a, essentially another monitor that you can draw on. So it's really pen to paper, quote unquote. Uh, or this relatively, I don't think it's really well known, it's called a mod book. And they take a, um, a MacBook, they take the screen and the keyboard off and put essentially a Cintiq screen on it. Um, I have to travel a lot for multiple reasons, so you know, dragging around your computer with this antique is huge, right? So the mod book was a really good, um, a really good decision. So I, I spent the money and, and bought the mod book. It was just buying like buying another computer, and boy oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. Like I really love it. Um, you know, it, it has um, increased my speed. 
contrary to what some people might think. Um, it allows me the freedom to maybe pull off some things that I couldn't pull off by hand without a lot of uh, errors and problems and fixing things. Uh, editing capabilities, uh, if, if you're an artist out there, you know, you draw like a wonky eye, then you have to like, if you ink it and you finally see it's wonky, you have to white it out, try and redraw it over the white out or the paint, and it's, it's a mess, right? Like it can be a problem. Um, so you don't have those problems here. You can solve those problems. If you draw a hand too big, you can shrink it down. You know what I mean? There are all these awesome things you can do. Um, Manga Studio has a function even where it can take the jitter out of your hand a little bit if you're trying to get a really smooth line. Um, these are all things that help you get the results you want while still using your hand. And um, it's just like another tool. It's another tool. I, I know it's, it can be kind of controversial, but. Um, Let's, let's look at some examples of um, working on it uh, in books that we've done. This is uh, how I start off in Manga Studio. It's not that much different from starting off on a piece of paper, right? Um, you start with thumbnails, really loose. Um, one thing that it has, it has a, a border tool, like for the panels. Uh, if you don't want to break your panels, I mean, you can if you want to, but um, you draw the panel and it makes layers inside the panel and so you can just draw in that panel and focus on that panel. It's kind of nice. You don't have to worry about erasing outside the border. Stupid little things like that, but they save you time in the end. Um, and you work in layers, so you can turn these off and on. Um, uh, it's hard to see there, but um, it's just refining the drawing more and more. You can use different colors, like you would blue or red lead, um, colored pencils, what have you. Um, it has all of the things that you can do in real life, but just easier and faster. Um, one thing that I've really found is a good advantage by, for, from using this is that I'm not so afraid to make marks. I know that sounds silly, where like you're drawing and inking and stuff, and you don't think you're afraid, but you know, if you have a brush full of ink, it's dangerous, right? Like <laughs> if you just slip, you sneeze or something, you know what I mean? You get this glop of ink on your page, you have to start over. That's a that's charm, right? Like that can happen. That's great, but. This, you know, it can help take it out of there, uh, the fear. Um, and I've found that my art has become a little bit more full of energy. It's a lot cleaner. Um, and I think it's done nothing but improve uh, our books. Uh, this is actually a, a page just inked for Radio Freaky Hannah number three, which isn't out yet. So. Um, so back to the thing that really made me dive into this was issue two with that complex page, the complex thing with the past and present merging into the frame. Um, there was one page in particular that was like, a, by no means am I comparing myself to this man, but like a Windsor McKay page where it's like one scene, you need to like wander through the scene, right? Awesome stuff. Um, it was written that way, so I had to figure that out. Um, <laughs> let me say that this isn't exactly how I drew it, because I had to work backwards from my file, so just bear with me. Um, so I started with the environment. Um, with this book, we do use photo reference. I mean, I don't photo trace, I'm not a tracer. Um, but <laughs> yes, photo reference. Uh, this is, uh, the, you know, you can see the clear path. Um, and then I went in and laid in the characters. It's hard to see up here, but I just screened back the background, which is another thing that's really nice to do too with this. If you want to set a certain environment and draw on top of it, you can turn down the volume a little bit and be able to see clearer what you're doing. Um, and then I added in the characters that are in the past. And one way to help communicate that was to draw them in like in a gray line to show. And whenever I would color them in, I um, turned down the opacity there as well. So they're almost like ghosts, um, which you could do practically if you brought it into Photoshop and messed with it in multiple pieces. But this is just much faster and much more efficient. I'll also uh, color things in Manga Studio a lot. Um, sometimes I'll use Photoshop depending on where I'm at, what I'm using. There's uh, more color. Bring the background back in. You can kind of see how it's going through the ghosted figures. Color the background. Uh, I grade this out a little bit too because you know um, a lot of the story takes place in fall, and we like to add like leaves to, to, for mood and like to tell a story. And I was looking at this, and like I need some kind of like foreground stuff and a little bit more texture, so. I went in and just started drawing leaves over top of everything uh, in nice little places. Color those, bring it all together like that. 
Um, then uh, I usually go and link all of my files in InDesign, and uh, I'll add black borders to it, and uh, then start lettering it. Um, you know, lettering digitally versus by hand. I have a huge, I admire people that can letter by hand really well. Uh, I went to school here, I graduated in 2004, and you know, you take typography classes and they make you letter by hand, I'm sure. I don't know if they still do that, they did back then. Um, it's hard, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> well, of course, I mean, and, and, it's, and it's a certain skill that not everybody can, can have, you know what I mean? Uh, but, you know, as a, I, I'm a graphic designer as my day job, so I appreciate typography, I know how to use it, so um, I letter digitally. Um, and then I treated the path balloons the same way as I did the characters. They're a little transparent, gray instead of black. Anything to tell the story. It looks a little bit, it looks crowded. Um, when you read it, it actually does flow through. Uh, one thing that's interesting, oh, there's also another conversation going on via text message, which is just another layer. Um, then credits, which was a topic <laughs> earlier. Um, and it all comes together to tell this story. I've had people tell me that they've read this book like, a multitude of ways, like they would read through the present first, go back, then read through the past all the way. They would go back and forth, uh, which is kind of interesting. I don't think I ever really thought about that when I was drawing it, but it's kind of like one of those perspectives from different people, you know, read things different ways, it's kind of fun. But I don't know how I would have done this as easily, practically. It, it would have been really tough. Um, it's all about balance. Uh, <laughs> these are my tools that I use um, pretty equally. Um, and I know that's pretty silly, but uh, <laughs> I, I really believe in using all of these to make a whole. It, it might not seem like you have to do that, because you don't, because you could just draw a comic on a piece of paper. But I found, for me, using all of these tools produces uh, what I feel is a pretty professional product. Um, it helps me tell the stories that we're trying to tell effectively. Um, I don't have. <laughs> Do I miss that? A little bit. And, I, and you know, I think that in, in the future, some different stories we may tell, I might do a hybrid method that I think I talked about the other day too, where I might draw everything uh, digitally, print it out in blue lines, and then ink it by hand. Because there is something that you can get inking things by hand that you can't necessarily reproduce digitally. Um, there's so many brushes and tools in Manga Studio in particular. They even have like Zipatone brushes that actually work like a tone and it isn't the bad half tone, what have you, in Photoshop. Um, and that program actually does a lot of stuff I don't even touch. Um, I treat it more like digital paper than I do bells and whistles, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> don't have to use a light box anymore. Uh, it's a digital light box. And <laughs> You know, there, there's, there's something to that as well. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with either, because I do enjoy doing both. Uh, it's just a new way to look at it. Um, and, you know, that's just what I do now. So thank you for you know, any questions, comments. You know, throw Rotten Tomatoes, you can do that too. <laughs> we'll stay on track and preserve time for the end. Let's do one quick, any comments from the panel? It was a really impressive presentation. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm very jealous. I did it last night. I'm intimidated. <laughs> You've made me want to buy a mod book now, so we're going to have to talk about this. They're pretty, I'm, they're pretty great. You can um, get them if anyone is interested. I'll, I'll give you this piece of information. Um, there is, oh crap, what's the name of the company? Uh, Axiotron makes them. They are, a, they are licensed from Apple. Like It's not an Apple product. It's this third party that makes them. And uh, there's a website called Gainsaver. That's where I got mine, and they actually use, I, my, like my shell was a used shell from an old computer, and they'll build it like with some new parts, some old parts, and like customize it to what you want, so maybe you can save a little bit of money. And that little bit of money I saved, I like ramped up the memory and stuff like that too. So it's not like you're buying a MacBook Pro and then like voiding the warranty or anything? Oh, I'm pretty sure my warranty's voided. I, I'm not sure, I don't remember. It's been a few years, I, mean, <laughs> I kind of didn't care. It's a new computer, so it's like, well, and they'll also, if you have a MacBook, you can send yours in and get it modded. Oh. Um, okay. So they'll do it to your computer. They, I haven't looked it up 
lately because I have mine and I don't really look into it too much, but um, they were going to do uh, MacBook Pros as well, and they're way more expensive, but a bigger screen, stuff like that. I mean, that would be my one big disadvantage, I think. I should have talked about that. But some disadvantages to it is um, the screen's kind of small, so that's kind of unfortunate, but you can zoom in, zoom out, so there's, that kind of fixes that. Um, I don't have original art to sell, uh, so that's, that's definitely, uh, you know, it, but if there was a page, you could maybe make a print, like, uh, of 10 or 50 and, like, sign them and do a little sketch, and, you know, on nice paper. That, it's, a, it's a weird thing that's happening right now. There are enough people doing it now that it's, quote, unquote, kind of normal. And you don't necessarily see it all the time. Like, if you're reading a comic, you don't necessarily know that it was drawn digitally. Um, Mike Norton, if you guys know who Mike Norton is, um, he made the switch, uh, and I don't think anybody knew. Uh, you can really tell on his Shazam book that he did, and Battle Pug, he does Battle Pug. That's all done pretty much how I work now, so, yeah. Thanks. All right. This is going to be a little bit incestuous because we have another person affiliated with Two-Headed Monster Comics next. Um, Katie Valeska, she'll give a brief talk as well. And while she's up there, I need to point out, because this is how her name actually came to my attention, she had a comic published as part of one of Elvis Costello's CDs. And so I thought that was pretty awesome for her. We'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't used PowerPoint in like 10 years, so we'll see how this goes. Um, all right. Um, hi. My name is Katie Valeska, as Dan said, and I am part of Two-Headed Monster Comics along with Joel and with James, our writer out in the audience. Um, I've been with them for about a year and a half now, and I've been drawing comics for three years. I've been drawing since I could hold a pencil, um, and I have a degree in graphic design from Ohio University, so during the day I work as a web designer. Um, so I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about, um, about my process and about, you know, why I chose to do a web comic over print to start and, you know, kind of the advantages and the challenges I've faced along the way and just really to tell you what a great tool the internet is for sharing your work. Um, so the majority of my work is done by hand, but the reason I started a web comic was it, kind of as an exercise to get myself back into drawing because after college, you know, I had been drawing and drawing and drawing and being judged and drawing and being judged and it's like you just get burnt out and you start working a 40 hour a week 45 hour a week job and you're, you don't have time for this stuff so you know I, I was going along in my life and I thought there's something huge that's missing like you know drawing is my favorite thing in the whole world why am I not doing this more often like I do have the time to do it you know but how do I keep myself on a schedule because you know any of you who are artists you know it's hard to keep keep yourself organized like that so I thought you know if there's a way that I could just share my work with a bunch of people and kind of get the feedback, you know, get some criticism, get some praise, you know, it would keep me motivated to continue drawing regularly. And so I decided um, on New Year's Day of 2010, I thought I'm gonna post one comic and put it online and just see what happens. And I did, and then I did this web comic for two years. So it was, you know, it was a good decision. And now I'm part of this cool, you know, indie self-publishing group and I get to do comic conventions and it's a good time. So um, my first encounter with digital media, as perhaps you know, many of yours, was back around 1997. Um, I was in middle school, and I would stay the night at my best friend's house because her parents had a fancy dial-up modem, and it was <laughs> really exciting because my parents didn't, and I was like, okay, let's you know, let's sit on the computer all night. This will be great. So I was a real fun sleepover guest. Um, so we would search like until two or three in the morning for um, scans of Sailor Moon comics. <laughs> and beautiful pictures like this. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd sit for like half an hour and just watch this, you know? <laughs> just like, what's next? What's at the bottom? I saw the thumbnail. I can't tell. What's going on? And like, can you even imagine? But we had all this art at our fingertips that we, you know, and we didn't have to go anywhere. We were just in our pajamas and we could see all this beautiful stuff and copy it and, you know, you know how it goes. So, you know, that's enough in 1997. But the, uh, the internet has obviously sped up a little bit since then. 
And now there are all sorts of ways for people to post, you know, to share not only, you know, whether or not they had a burrito for lunch or what they're doing in the bathroom, but there are, and their words, and, you know, and there are so many things online, like so many vehicles for that, like there's DeviantArt, there's Tumblr, WordPress, and um, an add-on called Comic Press, which is what I use for next year's girl. So this is actually a screenshot of my site. Um, as I said, I'm a web designer by day, so I have, I have some limited knowledge of um, CSS, which is a coding language that you can design websites with. So I use WordPress and I use this Comic Press add-on, and um, using CSS, I was able to, and it's, it's really easy, so if you guys are ever interested in that sort of thing, just go to the library. There are hundreds of books about you know, how to pick this stuff up, and it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, but using these tools allowed me to style the site the way I wanted, so I got to make my own header there and, you know, come up with which links I wanted where, and Comic Press is a really useful thing because um, they allow you a lot of options, and it's very customizable. Um, so, let's see. <laughs> so I used WordPress, and then using Google Analytics, which is a free tool, um, you just embed a line of code in the bottom of your, your web page. Um, it gives you an at-a-glance measurement of how many people are looking at your site on any given day, different hours of the day, like where your audience is, all around the globe, and it's a really interesting thing. It, it kind of helps you, too, to see, you know, if you're doing enough social media marketing for your site, because it's important, too, and um, just gives you a good idea of, of who's looking at your stuff. And it's, it's kind of neat, too, because you'll be like, wow, somebody in Alaska looked at my comic. That's neat. Somebody in Guatemala looked at my comic. You know, how does this work? Um, so I'll show you guys a few of my comics. So this is one of my favorites because I really like drawing food and I really like sushi and it's very superficial, but sushi, you guys, come on. Um, so if you take a look at my site, nextyearsgirl.com, you will soon come to realize that I'm a big foodie. So um, one of the concerns about having a web comic is merchandising it. And, and this wasn't really, you know, if you're trying to make money and if you're just trying to share art, you know, that's exactly what I started out doing and that's totally valid too. But when I started up with Two-Headed Monster, you know, we would go to these conventions and have these tables, and I'm like, what do I sell? I have this free comic online that anybody can go look at, like, you know, charge them admission and have them look at an iPad or something. So um, what I do right now is um, I have four prints of my favorite ones that I sell, and I try to pick the ones that aren't, it's an autobiographical comic, but I try to pick the ones that aren't so much about, like, oh, what did I do today? Da, 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 da. Here's what I had for lunch. You know, I try to pick things that people could identify with and like, even if they didn't know who I was, which is most everybody. So um, I have prints and I have buttons and um, towards the end of the year I'm going to have a paperback of the collected next year's girl up, up to this point. So that's just me. I've seen, um, you know, t-shirts, stickers, plush dolls, you know, paper doll kits. Like there are all sorts of options that you can do to, to merchandise your comic if you feel so inclined. Um, so this is a comic about a close acquaintance of mine called Anxiety. And um, in this age of, of Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and oversharing and you know too much about everybody, I probably know something about everybody in this room and I've never met most of you. Um, you know, doing an autobio comic is kind of an interesting thing because you know, you get to choose what level of information you're sharing. And what I always tried to do is sort of put a little spin of humor into the things that were maybe problems that I had in my personal life, things like that. And that's, that's what's so great about making comics is, is you can establish like, how much you're going to share with people. Because I think it's important to be honest and be truthful. But at the same time, you know, some people you know, you could take a little too far. Like, I don't need to know X, Y, Z about everybody. And that's what's so great is you can, there's so much stuff out there that you can find something that's kind of on your level and relatable. And that's why it's so great to just scan through all these different web comics because there's so much stuff out there. So I'm really happy that I started up doing comics when I did, which was in 2010, because it has allowed me to capture some really important moments in my life. I just picked a good time. I didn't know it was a good time at the time. But um, for instance, when my husband proposed to me, um, I made a comic about it, because I didn't have any other ideas that week. And I thought, well, hey, this works. <laughs> and so I, I felt really, really good about that, because you know, not only did I have this nice thing to keep as, as a good memory and a, a thing I can look back on and you know, show our kids someday and all that, but you know, instead of posting that, oh my god, look at my ring you know, on Facebook, I got to share this really <laughs> personal, meaningful thing uh, with my family and friends. And they got to kind of share in the moment with me. So, and not only that, but then you know, just preserving other memories. And this is just, you know, Autobio, you can do any kind of comic you want. The comics are so great. 
but it's, it's fun for me because, you know, if I want to share a story with somebody or share a memory or just reminisce, all I have to do is pull up my phone and be like, hey, look at this comic I did. You know, this is when we were up in Geneva and did this. And it's, I don't know, it's great. Like, just, just the accessibility of the internet and just the ease of sharing, I think, is really a really good tool for comic artists. And I've known so many people who have gotten into comics since you know the the internet's gotten to be such a, a, sh a tool for sharing, and that's I, I think that's great. Um, here's one other one. This is kind of relevant to the the current season. And uh, my husband Jason jokes around that he's actually the star of next year's girl, <laughs> and I don't actually doubt that that's true. Sometimes I look at that and I'm like, this is, this is totally about him. Um, so this this brings us to my favorite comics in the internet story, um, which Dan touched on as I walked up to the podium. Um, and this is just, this really just drives home, I think. I like sharing this. I, I try not to brag about it, but when somebody brings it up, I'm like, yes, let's talk about this. Because it's such a great story about the ease of, of, of sharing art on the internet and, and how you can show people you've never imagined, you know, the things that you do. And, and it's fun, you know. So I love Elvis Costello. I always have. And in fact, the title of my webcomic, Next Year's Girl, is a joke about procrastination, but is also a play on the Elvis Costello song, This Year's Girl, which I came up with in the shower because I was like, what am I going to call this thing? This is the New Year's Day. And I'm just like, got it, because I had Elvis playing in the background. And anyway, um, <laughs> so I got to see him in concert last year. And it was really amazing. And I, you know, I was just so tickled because I, I you know, obviously, I would, I didn't get to see him in the 70s, and, and I, I just imagined him to be just as cool. So, um, of course, I drew a comic about it. And every week when I would post my comic, I would share it on Facebook and Twitter. And if it was appropriate, I would throw a little hashtag on Twitter or throw an at reply to somebody, you know, if, if it was about a certain person. So this one, I posted the link, and I said, hey, I got to see Elvis Costello in concert. Woohoo, at Elvis Costello. And I just went on my merry way and forgot about it. So I got a couple, a, a couple emails throughout the week, and. One of them was like, the first line was, hi, my name is Steve. And you know, I thought, oh, you know, maybe somebody saw my comic. That's cool. Maybe, maybe I have a fan. So I, I clicked into it. And this guy says he's from Elvis Costello's management team. And I thought, oh my god, I'm in so much trouble. Like, I got to take this down. I have probably you know, broken all the copyright rules. What am I doing? I'm done. I'm never going to pick up a pencil again. This is it. So I'm reading. You know, I shut myself up for a second and read that email. And he said, you know. I'd really like to talk to you about possibly using your, your comic. We really, we really enjoyed it, and we'd like to use it for a potential upcoming project that we can't really talk about right now. And I was like, yes, OK, please, you know, please, 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 please. So I wrote back, and I was like, dear Mr. Maidman, that would be very nice. Thank you. Please tell me some more, you know, trying to, <laughs> trying to play it cool. And um, so what it turns out was they wanted to adapt it for a postcard in his latest box set that came out late last year. So you can see up in the front there, the little tiny little baby thing, that's my postcard. <laughs> and so now, I, you know, I've, I've had this thing that um, you know, I, can, I can keep forever that's this awesome souvenir. And it's, it's this thing that I got to contribute to, to someone that I admire very, very much. And it was just a total fluke that this thing happened. But it's all just because I just Hashtag, you know, Elvis Costello at the end of my Twitter thing. That's it, you know? And, and that's, it's just the, the ease of this. And I think it's so important when you have work to share it through as many vehicles as possible. And that's why the internet's so great, because you have all these different blogs. You have Tumblr. You have Pinterest now. You have all these different things that you can use. And, you know, it's, use them. You know, if you, want, if you want to share your stuff online, like, just do it. It's free. It's easy. And you never know who you're going to meet or talk to or who's going to see your work. So last, um, this is another internet-related thing. On Facebook, um, there was a call for artists put out a couple months ago by Alan Martin, who is the writer of Tank Girl, which is my very favorite comic ever, which you would probably not guess from my adorable, precious web comics. But I love Tank Girl. So um, he just put out this thing, and he said, hey, you know, we've got this project coming up. It's kind of low budget, but we're looking for artists. And you know, if anybody's interested, you know, hey, throw your hat in the ring. And, so a lot of people just link to their, their portfolios and whatnot. And I thought, OK, I'm going to draw some really cool Tank Girl pictures. So this is my Tank Girl picture that I drew. And I haven't heard from him. I don't expect to. But you know, still, it's, it was cool, because I got to look at all these other people's attempts at Tank Girl. And, and just it was like this little community got formed just in this kind of thing that could otherwise have been a, a, a competition. You know? But yeah, really, just I mean, what I like to share with people is just you know, if you're drawing, if you're writing, you know, get on Facebook, talk about it, get on Twitter and talk about it, like see what other people are doing and just try and connect with them because a lot of other artists are really um, 
responsive to that sort of thing. Like I've I've sent tweets to, to artists I like who had don't know me from anybody and they've been really friendly and then you can go meet them at a comic con. They're like, oh yeah, hey, we talked about X, Y, Z. And I don't know, it's just a thing. It's like we have all these tools at our disposal and I think it's really important to take advantage of that. And it's, you know, you never know what'll happen. So that's that. Does anybody have any questions? I haven't personally because um, when I started thinking about merchandising, it was when I joined up with Two Headed Monster Comics, and at that point, um, I'm, I'm currently working on a print piece that, that James out there wrote, and so I've, I wrapped up my web comic in the spring. So by the time I started talking to these guys, I was already thinking about winding this down, so I never got to the point where I was advertising on it. But that is a big. Um, that's actually a very good point. Um, yeah, if you have your own website, uh, ad revenue is a big thing for a lot of comic artists. It's how they pay for bandwidth. It's how they pay for um, traveling to shows and paying for tables and things like that. So, you know, yeah, that's a really good way to do it. <laughs> yes. Were you at Independence Day? I was, yeah. Because I realized I bought a pin with sushi on it. I just realized <laughs> it's yours. That was mine, yes. And thank you very much. <laughs> that's funny. Anybody else? All right. Um, back there? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thank you.